please the microphone will find you and simply say your name and allow it to go to the next person immediately thank you Okay, good morning all. Uh, my name is Abdul Ibrahim. I'm a neuroscientist and uh, I specialize in pediatric neuroimaging. I'm from Nigeria. Thank you, Abdul. You're welcome. Uh, my name is Asima Robert. I manage electronics in the MRI building in Uganda. Good morning, everyone. I'm Patience Nisima. I work with the MRI project here in Bara University as a project administrator. And for those introducing yourselves, you could please stand up as you introduce yourself. Good morning. I'm Tina Inebazi, and I'm a student here at my Good morning, everyone. Sally Varega Nashavin, by Medical Engineering, Makerere University. Good morning, all. I'm Boa Isaac, uh, by Medical Engineering. I've just finished from Makerere University. Thank you, all. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kaziwe Abdallah. I'm a graduate trainee by Medical Engineering with Nakasero Hospital. Good morning to you all. My name is Douglas Geng, a biomedical engineer and current med training with the Infectious Disease Institute and Makere Biomedical Research Center. Uh, thank you very much. My name is uh, Alfred Denyoku. I'm the biomedical engineer at Kaimpe National Referral Hospital. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sandra Chekumbia. I'm a student at Mass. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mokwaya Pias Kabanda. I recently finished biomedical engineering from Makere University, and I'm a researcher in physiotherapy. Good morning, everyone. My name is Senta Mutoni. Apparently, I've also just finished biomedical engineering, and I'm training with Uganda Art Institute. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mobiru Bernard. I'm here to report what is happening here to the outside world. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mukundane John, here to photograph every event taking place. You're welcome. Yes. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kavuma Joseph Mark, a finalist of electrical and electronics engineering here at Mass. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lilian Nasinja, a third year biomedical engineering student here at Mbara University. Good morning, everyone. I'm Natkunda Jonath, doing biomedical engineering third year at Mbara University. Good morning, everyone. I'm Natkunda Gift, BME student at MASC. Good morning, everyone. I'm Patrick Kavanda, uh, staff at MASC. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Martin Galiwango from the Department of Electron Electronics and Electronics Engineering here at FAST. Uh, my love and passion is in uh, industrial automation and uh, artificial intelligence. You're most welcome. Good morning everyone, Samuel Mosco is my name. I'm a staff at Murray University working with Director of Research and Radio Training. Good morning, everyone. My name is Maureen Nalumansi, BME student here at Mass. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kulumbaiza Akumsasi, Biomedical Engineering, Barra University. Good morning, everyone. My name is Henry Ocheng, Biomedical Engineering, year two at Mass. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lloyd Joshua, 
biomedical engineering student, Mara Novas. Good morning, everyone. Alan Rodin Jidoy is my name, biomedical engineering student at Mass. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nam Tabi Maria Helen, biomedical engineering year three, Mass. Good morning, everyone. I'm called Dimatavo Majid. Uh, and the, I'm in the mic this side. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm called Sankara Dalhanga from uh, Empower Youth in Technology, which is an innovation center here in Barara. Thank you very much for all that have introduced themselves. Um, I think it would be better if you clapped for someone when they mentioned their name and where they came from. So you could clap for all the people that have already. Hi everyone, I'm uh, Stefan Duplessis. I'm a clinician by training, but I mostly do um, research on high field MRI and functional neuroimaging, but I'm very excited to expand my knowledge in low field. Good morning everyone. My name is Nakai Zamara, biomedical engineer and get to my University of Science and Technology. Good morning everyone. My name is Amorim Deborajin. I am a biomedical engineering student in Yatu and I'm very passionate about innovation. Good morning everyone. My name is Wamosi Isaac Samuel. A final year student by medical engineering here at Mbara University of Science and Technology at this very faculty of, science, of applied sciences and technology. My, very, my love and passion is dialysis and development, and to pursue development of diagnostic equipment. Thank you. This is Philip is my name, and I'm a biomedical engineer, and I was among the few students who started biomedical engineering here at MAST. Thank you. My name is James Suleiman Pofo. I'm a clinical MRI radiographer, and I'm a lecturer in medical imaging at the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. I'm also a researcher in the application of MRI in prostate cancer management. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Patience Ogichuku. I'm a radiographer from Nigeria. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Precious Mflanga. I'm from Zimbabwe. I'm a radiographer. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tumi Sankoro. I'm a radiographer from Botswana. Good morning, everyone. I'm Bambale Jo from Kampala MRI Center. And I'm, I'm here in the capacity of someone who has worked with a, a high field and a low field MRI machine. Thank you. You're all welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, I don't think I introduced myself. I'm called Naira Maureen. I'm a student at Bar University of Science and Technology. I'm currently the Vice Guild President, and I do electrical engineering. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maureen. My name is Dennis Thomas Lukaya. I work with Masters as a faculty administrator. Um, the Dean and Professor Godwin, we have not forgotten you, but uh, you don't rush big people. Your time will come and uh, we will introduce you. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's very nice that at least we know who is here. We know each one of us. Um, uh, Mwambale, when you spoke, I was not looking up. I kept on listening, you know, uh, from Ghana, from uh, Zimbabwe, from Nigeria. Then, ooh, Mwambale. Then I said, we've come back to Uganda. Uh, very good. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
we are here for a very important function. We will have it uh, commissioned. I am going to request that we now uh, stand up and uh, have the anthems as it is the practice at the university here. An important event like this is a, a national event in our own opinion because it is international. Who are we to host each one of you, not only from a different country, but a different village locally here? Can we have the DJ uh, help us? But uh, before you do that, Maureen, you used to sing. Yes, Mr. DJ, you hold on. You're very welcome, please. Welcome. You can sit uh, near anyone. Maureen, you know how to sing. You can take us to the anthems. I'll just okay. try. I'll, okay. I'll just try. Mariam, you could come. You're going to lead the opening prayer. So we're going to have the Uganda National Anthem and the Ambar University of Science and Technology Anthem. Yes. So feel free to join in. This might be your chance to learn the Uganda National Anthem. Let us all stand up. Oh, you can may God uphold thee. We lay a future in thy hand. United free for liberty together will always stand Barara University succeed we must with God's will we shall make the best of us let us unite and cooperate to build a nation in different sectors, our pride and ego must will shine forever and will be victors. My alma mater, long live, long live, Barara University. Utni mam viva. Let us let us bless them and we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for this moment. We thank you so much for the different we have in this place, God. And I pray that as we are going through everything, Lord, you're going to open our inner ears and our inner eyes to receive all this information, my Lord. And I pray, God, that after this workshop, as we go out there, God, we shall be able to practice what we've learned here. And I pray all this through our Father. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats. We have a few visitors that have come on. Maureen, let's uh, have them introduce themselves. Those who have just joined, we asked everyone to use the microphone introduce yourself tell us your name and if you have some sweets in the pocket we can eat them hi uh, i'm tom o'reilly uh, i'm from leiden university medical center in the netherlands um, i'm a physicist by training and i've been doing a lot of the development on the mri scanner over in the netherlands hello i'm josh harper and actually, I was a student at Penn State with Dr. Jones, so we, we go way back. Uh, now I'm a professor of engineering in Paraguay at uh, a German Paraguay University there. And um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, and also learning with the rest of the MUS team how to build the system with, with the help of these folks from the Netherlands. So very happy to be here, and hope, hopefully get to meet all of you. Thank you. Good day. Uh, my name is Wouter Tevesen. I'm from Leiden University, uh, same as uh, Tom. And by training, actually, long way back, I'm a radiographer. And since then, came a long way. So I'm really thrilled to uh, 
there's probably quite a number of radiographers in here. So that's, I always love. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So, Mr. Lukaya, I practiced all night. I wanted to pronounce Walter's name. Please. And <laughs> please, please. yes, but now he has already pronounced it, so maybe we can move on. Okay, Hello, Vauta Tevasa. <laughs> yes, I, I practiced all night and I made sure Tom, I th thank you for making Tom speak. He promised he didn't want to talk. Yeah, and I'm happy he had to say something. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen. Thank you very, very much. Each one of you is very welcome to Uganda, to Mbarara, and to Kihumuro. Kihumuro is seven kilometers from the town center. We are sitting on a piece of land that is uh, 480 acres of land. It is crossed by a river down at the end called the River Rizi that supplies Mbarara with its fresh drinking water. And at the top we have a hill and there is a dream that one day we will build a windmill because it's very, very cold if you have noticed. It's a lot of wind. And we think that wind can power some of our bulbs and pump some water one of these days. But also, it might power the next generation MRI law field. Who knows? So, we are proud really, really to host you. Mbarara is uh, blessed. We owe a lot of this to the perseverance of uh, Dr. John Zobongloch. He is a simple man, but he is extremely well connected. His network has brought us uh, dividends. We are here because he is a man that shares his passion and builds teams. Dr. Jones is now our Dean of this faculty. He was Deputy Dean. So he's, he's the reason that several people are interested in lots of innovation at this faculty. And now that he is in charge, they say the sky is the limit, but I think for him he goes to Mars. I think so. I think the sky is too small for him. We believe that everything will be good. So I am going to request uh, uh, Maureen, my co-MC, to now come and take up from the um, uh, uh, on our program. Maureen is also under mentorship from me, so I will ensure that she has a maximum control of the microphone, and uh, you are a winner dive into it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lukaya. Um, Mr. Lukaya mentors everyone. As long as you are interested, you can't walk out of his office the same. He always teaches you one new thing every single time, so I'm grateful. Um, the next item here, um, we shall have Dr. Waswa. Okay. So we shall have... Uh, our dearest uh, faculty dean, we shall have him introduce the MRI project and MRI workshop and welcome us all here. So Dr. Jones Obongo Lodge, yesterday he claimed that someone else, is it Tom pronounces his name better? Dr. Jones Obongo Lodge, thank you very much. Please clap for him as he comes over. Uh, good morning, everyone. I want to take this opportunity to welcome all of you to Mbara University of Science and Technology. Uh, this is the Faculty of Applied Sciences and Technology. This faculty started in 2016. That is when we opened our doors to the student community. But Mbara University started in 
1989 as a faculty of medicine. So since then, until 2016, we have been doing a lot of science because it is a university of science and technology. But when we opened this faculty in 2016, the university was now full because technology came in. So it now assumed its full name of science and technology. At the faculty here we have only engineering programs so far at this building. And those include electrical engineering, biomedical engineering, which was our pioneer program, and uh, petroleum engineering, and then computer engineering. In the next academic year, we are going to launch civil engineering and then mechanical engineering. So it will be a fully fledged faculty of engineering, and that is how sometimes we want to call it. I am glad to see all of you here from different walks of life, from different backgrounds to come and uh, visit with us here at Mbarara. I'm thrilled that uh, among the stars here, there are guests who are from better institutions than we are, but they are still humble enough to come and supposedly learn from us, but also teach us a lot of things. So some of you in the crowd, uh, we will call upon you to give your experiences also, not only about MRI, but also about other technologies. Because as a faculty of technology, we are interested in developing innovations across the spectrum uh, of different technologies. Uh, Mr. Lukaya is my 2IC here. He is the faculty administrator. That means he's on the administration side. I'm on the academic side as the dean, but the, on the administration side, Mr. Lukaya is the boss. So he also still comes to my office and says, Mr. Dean, they don't do this like that. This is how they do it and say, yes, thank you, sir. So we make a good team with him, and I'm glad that he's mentoring a lot of people within the faculty, both the staff and the student community that have gone through Mr. Lukaya's hand are always very happy to interact with him. I want to welcome you to the first Sub-Saharan Africa Lawfield MRI workshop uh, that is going to run throughout the week. Uh, there is going to be sharing of information and sharing of knowledge here and there throughout the week. So we will learn and teach each other. I welcome all our international guests uh, who have come in some of them directly from the airport up to here. Uh, the, the, the transport officer told us that I've just brought some people this morning and immediately after talking to him, one of the guests called us and said, I want to come, where is the place? I was like, oh, I thought he's still sleeping. So I want to thank you for taking your time and interest to come here and uh, be with us. I just want to introduce the MRI project, the journey that we have taken uh, from where we started up to now. And uh, I think my presentation is somewhere there. If you could load that for me, please. Okay, uh, as, as the Lord that, uh, the MRI project for us has come a long way. Uh, I finished my university degree as an undergraduate student 
without really talking about MRI. I was doing electrical engineering and uh, the MRI came to me, I would say, by mistake. Uh, after my training as an electrical engineer, I came and started working in the regional hospital here, which is a few, a few kilometers uh, down the road. And uh, I didn't know anything much about MRI. This is always what computers do. They have a tendency of losing people's things. I also remember a scenario when we were doing our final year projects as students. And then, by then we, we had the floppy disk. So we had our project on a floppy disk, they say bring the floppy disk here, they plug it in and we are ready to present and then they click, they say there is nothing in this floppy disk. <laughs> <laughs> so we were stranded for quite a long time. But uh, I'm glad that uh, they have found it. I feel like this position is too restrictive for me. I'm going to try and come in the middle here. The people who put the podium will probably not be happy with me, but uh, the projector is also in my eyes. So I think I'll be here. So, uh, okay, thank you. So this is the first time we are trying to do this, so you will bear with us if there are glitches here and there next time it will be much, much better. Okay. So, uh, that is the beginning of my journey in uh, MRI. I told you I was working in a regional hospital here and it had no MRI unit but it had other imaging devices ct x-ray and the rest of it a professor from penn state visited my university and he was doing some work in the hospital i helped him with a few devices that he had come with and then we had a chat and he's like uh, would you wish to go for further studies? I said, of course, I would, especially if there is uh, a chance. So Dr. Stephen Schiff took me to Penn State in 2013. I joined Penn State to do my PhD uh, degree in, and my research topic was in law field MRI. So when I went, we started making MRI, winding coils like that in 2015. And uh, with my colleague, Josh, had come in and uh, we would be in the lab in the middle of the building with no windows, but there is AC that would uh, make sure the air is fresh. And you, that is where I also learned to take coffee. When I left Uganda, we only drink tea here. We hear about coffee, but we export it. We don't drink it. But in that lab, 
we would drink a lot of coffee. So we used to wind the coil like that. And uh, with that lousy system, we were able to get some images out of it. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with MRI, uh, that system was 4 milli Tesla. So that is 0 0.004 Tesla, if you compare to your 1.5 uh, Tesla systems, then you know where we are coming from. Uh, the images might not look good, but uh, when we saw those images, we slept for weeks in celebration. We didn't go to party, we went to sleep because we were for some good time. So, uh, I finished my PhD and came back to Uganda and with the support of Dr. Steve with some money that he won from NIH funding, we started what we would call our MRI lab at MAST. Uh, we'll have a tour and you will see in the basement where we are doing uh, some of our work. And uh, Dr. Steve also brought in other collaborators, the Leiden University Medical Center, where Walter and Tom come from. And that is the reason that uh, Tom and Walter are here, because of that collaboration through their director, Dr. Andrew Webb whom we will also listen to. There was another collaborator, which is in the Netherlands, the Technical University of Delft in the Netherlands. Also, we got some funding, and with that funding, we are able to sponsor a PhD student, Emma Aishakia, he graduated from here with his PhD, and his work was trying to improve the homogeneity and resolution of these images that look like that. If we can get some of these images, can you use artificial intelligence, for instance, machine learning, to make sure that they are clinically viable? So that is uh, what uh, Emma specialized in, and with support from TU Delft, he has graduated and is now heading a department uh, in one of the universities in the capital city in Kampala. We have another student who is now on the program, a PhD student. She is also a staff here and uh, she is also doing her research in law field MRI. And uh, in our lab, we started to replicate the system that we did at Penn State and we quickly realized that uh, while in the US power didn't see much of an issue uh, when you come to Uganda power becomes a very big issue uh, you have power going off here and there every time and the system that we are building we will also have a look at it in, in the lab there was relatively bigger than the system we built at Penn State. From 4 milli Tesla, we wanted to try and upgrade to 50 milli Tesla. So apart from the power, the system was also very noisy. And uh, I am not saying that it screams at night. Uh, the uh, electrical noise that it generates makes it very hard to image because ideally when you look at the system like that it's basically a giant antenna if you hooked up your tv to this you probably will get very good signals coming out of it as uh, so as an antenna it also picks up lots of other uh, radio signals that you do not want to have in your mri uh, imaging so, when we are still struggling with that system, our friend Tom 
from LUMC said, I think you guys should stop. Looks like we have a better system to work with, which does not need too much power and uh, is not a giant antenna like the one you are building. So this is a system at Leiden University Medical Center built by Tom and his friend Walter and the rest of the team over there. And uh, they could acquire significantly better images. So we started saying, I think there is some life at the end of the tunnel with these uh, low field MRI systems. And this is also around 50 millitesla, 0 0.05 tesla systems. So most of the low field systems that we have uh, here are permanent magnet systems with a huge magnet up, another huge magnet down, and probably 0 0.3 tesla and above. Okay? So we are talking of systems that are below 0 0.1 tesla. So we think that if we can get images like this, we are approaching clinical applications with this low field MRI system. So we said, hey, our friend, can we learn how to build your system as well? So Tom sent us designs and uh, we did 3D printing of the designs and those little magnets. Those are the same magnets that Tom uses here. So these are permanent magnets as well. The difference with the big permanent magnet systems is that uh, these are small, small permanent magnets. So they are not as heavy as you uh, find in the regular permanent magnet system. For the past one year or so, we have been learning how to build the Holbach array system, as it is called, as a potential replacement for the coil-based systems that we have been trying to build. Because of the challenges that I have just told you. So this is a 3D printed system that we assembled in our lab and uh, Ivan Ivan was leading this. Ivan is uh, our chief in the lab there. He will take us through uh, what he is doing in, in the lab. So after we have learned a little bit of this, we now say, I think maybe it is time to convince our friend Tom and his team to come and help us build the uh, this other system here okay because it is basically the similar system that we were trying to build at this point so tom came about a week ago last monday he was here and started building this system in our lab down in the basement we will also pass by and have a look at what is what is going on there okay so then we said maybe it is time to let the world know of what we are trying to do as well and that is why how the first sub-saharan africa low field mri workshop came about to be in uganda that we can learn from the professionals who are building the low field system that it is not only us who know about the system but a few people outside there if we plant the seed we think that it will grow and it will mature one day and we get to harvest what is what is there other efforts to introduce MRI within Africa uh, also came about in 2019 when I attended the ISMR MRM conference in Montreal, Canada, I met uh, a, a young scientist from McGill University in Canada, and she was saying, I have looked around in this conference, which has over 5,000 people, and I think you are the only one who has traveled from Africa. I said, is that true? 
said, yeah, it looks like, I, but we are going to continue looking around and maybe we'll land on some of them. Then we landed on Josh and I'm like, this is my African friend. I was, <laughs> I was with him in the lab for several years, but we can't say this is African as well. But uh, we, we didn't get uh, any other person. There could have been other people there. But uh, when we had a meeting with her, she said we should have uh, something that would promote MRI research and development in Africa. Because uh, most of you who probably have practiced uh, outside of Africa know that a lot of MRI units are used not only for imaging, but also for research purposes. But for us here, if we have our MRI machine, we don't want anybody to touch it because it is very expensive. It is, if it breaks down just that, that, that you are trying to carry out some research, that is going to cost some millions of shillings. And uh, our money is not that very strong. So even something small costs millions. So you will not be allowed to touch many of our MRI systems for your research purposes. You can do clinical work because they are bought to do that clinical work, but for research purposes, it's a little bit hard. So we say, let's form a group, an association. So we formed uh, the Consortium for Advancement of MRI Education and Research in Africa, which we call CAMERA. And this started as a, co a subcommittee from ESMRMB, which is a, a chapter of ISMRM in Europe. And uh, when we look at the composition of uh, camera then, it includes people not only from Africa, but also from outside Africa. Uh, uh, Professor Andrew Webb was our main promoter of the ISMRM, uh, uh, the camera initiative. So the camera initiative is to strengthen research collaborations within Africa, establish industry organizational partners, support MRI research, provide educational resources, and drive innovations to solve some of the needs that uh, we have in Africa. So through camera, I landed on uh, uh, Dr. Godwin Obole. That is how we came to start work with Dr. Godwin uh, under, under camera. After a while, we said that maybe we need something that is more specific to Africa. Can we form a chapter uh, for the African scientists. So we came up with the Smart Africa Network, which is basically strengthening research uh, in MRI within Africa. Of course, with still collaboration from our partners and other international institutions. So through the Smart Africa uh, network, we were supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, I think I've not put it here. We are supported by the CZI uh, grant to do MRI training, recruit MRI scientists who are doing their own research or practice in isolation, that can we come together and form a group, can we come together and form a consortium? Bwambale is here from uh, the MRI center in Kampala. And for a long time we were doing MRI here, we didn't know that Bwambale has a very good MRI in, uh, in, 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 in Kampala. And uh, he knows a lot about MRI actually in Uganda. So through this initiative, we are trying to bring ourselves together. Instead of Bwambale working alone in Kampala, I am working alone here. Somebody is working alone in Kumi, in Gulu and wherever. Can we come together and form an association of MRI scientists to push our agenda as MRI 
researchers so that we can also join our international counterparts uh, when we go for these conferences uh, with a backing that this is uh, an African chapter of the ISM MRM. So from the Smart Africa Network now comes the first Sub-Saharan Africa Law Field MRI workshop that I'm going to leave Dr. Obole to tell you more about the workshop. So this workshop was brought here by the Smart African Africa Network MRI Initiative and this is the first workshop that we are doing. And we believe that there are going to be several other workshops uh, about MRI across the African continent. I want to thank you and welcome you to Mbarara University of Science and Technology. Looks like my welcome slide is no longer there. <laughs> the floppy disk has come in. But welcome to Mbarara University of Science and Technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Jones. A uh, round of applause for uh, Dean. Um, Tom, Josh, and Walter had to go and uh, do more work in the lab. So I thank you all for listening. And I think we've picked a lot from what he had to say, the power of teamwork. Uh, if you're here and you don't do biomedical engineering, there are also magnets, so that's electrical. They use some magnets in there. So this is for everyone. If you like pick interest, then it's really good for you. So uh, without wasting any more time, I'm going to request Dr. Jones to come and officially open the session. Thank you. I forget uh, I was supposed to do this after my presentation. Uh, so, Mr. Dennis told me uh, that when you're opening, you say, with the powers entrusted to me. <laughs> and uh, I think that power comes from all of you and our university uh, management. Our vice chancellor was not able to join us today, but we are here for a full week and uh, he's going to come around during the week and uh, join us in some of the sessions that we'll be doing. But I want to declare this workshop open and I wish you all the best during the week. Thank you very much and thanks to MRI. I've gotten to meet people from Botswana, Nigeria, and oh, and Uganda. Oh, Uganda. I've been here. So. Yeah. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you for being here. Uh, so we're going to have uh, the citation of our first keynote speaker, who is doc Dr. Andrew Webb. Uh, he's not around, so we shall have the citation first and his presentation next. The, the person who is going to read the citation is called Tina Ainemba Wazi. She does electrical engineering. She's in her second year. Uh, yes, that is all I know for now. Good afternoon. Our first keynote speaker, Professor Andrew Webb graduated from the University of Bristol with a bachelor's degree in chemistry and obtained his PhD from the University of Cambridge. After a postdoc in the Department of Radiology at the University of Florida, he joined the faculty of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. He was then appointed full professor in 2000 
and worked for three years in the Department of Physics at the University of Wurzburg on the Humboldt Fellowship. In 2008, he was appointed to run the newly formed C.J. Gotha Center in the Department of Radiology at Leiden University Medical Center. His main research areas are RF design for high-field MRI and translation of new engineering concepts into the clinic supported by an ERC advanced grant. Recently, his lab has moved into the area of sustainable open source slow field MRI for, develop, for, low, for developing countries, funded by Simon Stephen Perry. In addition to over 300 peer reviewed publications, he has authored four academic textbooks on medical imaging and biomedical instrumentation. He's an associate editor for Magnetic Resonance in Medicine and on the editorial board of several other MR journals. Most meaningfully, in 2010, he founded the Nadine Barry Smith Trust, which supports four student fellowships, Paya for Women in Science and Engineering. Thank you very much, Tina. She's such a great reader. So we shall have Professor Andrew Webb's presentation projected because he couldn't make it here. Have to make 
the systems work inside a shielded room, we have to have high power, cooling water, very expensive. We have to have a contract to fix this thing every year. That's very expensive. And we have very, very trained technicians who also add to the cost. So why, even in the Netherlands, do we need to think about more affordable healthcare? Well, if you look at projections here, within the EU, we have almost 3% growth as a function of GDP, but the Netherlands is projected to be almost 6. So we start to get spiraling healthcare costs. And let's think a little bit further outside the Netherlands. If we look at the world as a whole, more than 70% no access to MRI whatsoever. And this was the starting point of us thinking about trying to develop more cheap and accessible systems. We've been working with a group in sub-Saharan Africa in Uganda on the subject of pediatric hydrocephalus. So this is Waterhoft, water on the brain in kids. And you can see it's an easy thing to image if you've got an MRI because you're just looking at the fluid inside. Is there blood there? Have you put in a shunt? Has the fluid gone? Has the fluid not gone? But of course there is no MRI in Uganda. So could we build a low cost system, 20 or, or 30,000 euros, which is sustainable and portable, it could be used in Uganda. So could we make it 1% of the cost, and in addition, not to be housed in a hospital like the LUMC here, but rather to be portable so it could be taken from village to village. And if we look at the challenges, we have to say, what do we need currently? Well, we've got to cut the cost, right, by 99%. So this is not a simple cost cut. We have to make sure that there are no maintenance costs. So if something breaks, it has to be repairable. We can't have something where the temperature is nicely controlled and we have power that runs all the time. So this thing has to be very robust. And finally, we've got to make it very, very simple to run. And we have to look at how do you design things sustainably. Here in the Netherlands, is probably the most sustainable cell phone. Uh, and if we look at why is it sustainable, it's easy to repair, it's always upgradable, and ultimately you can recycle those components. And so those are the things that we're going to try and build into our design. So we design our magnet from very, very simple, very cheap magnets here. These are similar to the ones that are holding things up on your fridge, a little bit stronger than that. But we use thousands and thousands of these. And we put them in certain configurations, which again, mathematically is quite complicated, which I won't bore you with, but we get this so that we get a perfectly uniform magnetic field. And we use these very small magnets so that they're safe. There's no danger in them uh, coming together with uh, strong forces, and that means that's important for local production. So here's the magnet that we produce. So not a million euros, but 10,000 euros and not one ton, but 70 kilos, something that could be carried by a couple of people or maybe even put in a back feeds. 25 centimeter diameter means that we can scan children's heads. Lots of other equipment goes into an MRI system, of course, and all of these components we've designed so that they can be put on the 3D printer. And a key part of this in terms of sustainability is that everything is open source. So all the parts, all of the designs are available for people so they can do it themselves or they can repair things easily. And this is to keep in with the general US sustainable development goals. So here's the whole setup that we've put together. You can see it fits on a table, it's not inside a particular room, and it just plugs into the wall. And what kind of images do we get out? Well, they're certainly not as good as the two million euro based system. But if you look at these, you can see that to look at hydrocephalus, to look at fluid, these are certainly good enough. And we can even separate out the white matter and the gray matter in the brain, and this is a key part of a project we're running with the Gates Foundation in terms of looking at pediatric brain development in developing countries uh, and how that is affected by things like malnutrition and countermeasures to that. And we can also image within the forearm or the leg, we can look at the muscle and the lipid, the fat around that, and of course, this is a very non-invasive way of looking at nutritional deficits, malnutrition, and again, how the programs that are being set up to try and counteract that are actually working. 
One of the additional factors that is nice about these very low field MRI systems is that normally if you've got some metallic implants or you have a shrapnel wound through a war zone, you can't have an MRI. But we can do that. So if you look at your 1.5 or 3 Tesla, which are the standard MRI systems, the image is destroyed by any of these metallic implants. This 50 milli Tesla system, much weaker at the top there, you see there's no such artifacts. So if we look at the advantages of our low field, very cheap, no sighting costs, patients who couldn't have an MRI can now have one, and if you've ever had an MRI, you know how loud that is, this system is essentially silent. So what are we doing over the next few years? Well, within the Netherlands, we're going to be developing with our clinical colleagues here at the LUMC, new ways of putting MRI to, to use. So maybe in the intensive care unit, maybe in the emergency department, and also following up with uh, pediatric development. And then in the developing world, we're working, as I mentioned, with the Gates Foundation and also a company called Hyperfine, who also makes these kind of systems. And the idea here then is to look at infant brain injury uh, in many, many different countries, particularly concentrating uh, on Africa, using this kind of system that can really be wheeled up to the bed of the patients. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I've hopefully uh, given you something to think about in terms of using our new technology to help in cheaper and simpler and more accessible and sustainable healthcare. Professor Webb, um, I would like to have two people or three comment about the presentation. Thank you very much. First of all, I'm grateful for this opportunity. And on behalf of the entire geography fraternity, we are very excited. I, I, I did tell you how I also, I'm also the president of the geographers in Uganda. But it's, I feel like I've been discussing with my colleague here. I feel this has not been given the hype it requires as a milestone that we have gotten as a country. Because in the whole of Western region, there's no MRI. In the whole of Northern region, I think this is when they have had something like an MRI. So I, I told him, I, in fact, I expected the president of the country to be part of this first, first encounter of the MRI. But all in all, I am very grateful. And I'm very happy that you're even calling upon other people to work together so that we can push this as a country. I'm very glad for that. And another thing I had in the presentation, he mentioned that the, the low field MRI can help image people with metals with limited artifacts. Does that mean this machine can also image people with implants or something like that? Thank you very much, very much, Wambale. Okay, any other comments? Yes, thank you very much. My name is Mosiba Samuel, and I'm delighted and honored to participate in the Sub-Saharan Africa Low Field MRI Workshop. And I have to say it's great work and it's quite a great milestone. Uh, the speaker talked about the M. I would love you to expound on the issue of people who have metallic, I have friends who have like metallic bones. Someone's hand was replaced by a metallic part. I would love to expound on how the MRI uh, can affect because these are magnets and metals attract magnets. So I'm not very well conversant, but I'm not seeing how feasible it is how someone can be passed through the MRI, yet it's a magnetic system and this person has a metal what he gets stuck inside. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Samuel. Um, maybe you could answer.
Um, you, your question will be answered because we have another keynote speaker. And I think I agree with Wambale. We should have had the president of Uganda here because this is really a great event. But next time, better. Or we shall have more people. This is just the beginning, not the end. So any other comments? Um, let's once again clap for, the, for Professor Webb. So next, uh, we shall have we shall have Tina read the citation of the, the the next keynote speaker. Since she read so well, we decided to give her another chance to read again. So our second keynote speaker. Professor Godwin Obole is an associate professor of radiology at the University of Ibadan, Nigeria, a senior visiting fellow at the Wellcome Center for Integrating Neuroimaging of the University of Oxford, and the, <laughs> and the president of the Neuroradiological Society of Nigeria and secretary to the Faculty of Radiology of the West African College of Surgeons. His, re his research focuses on developing adaptable, patient-centered imaging systems in resource poor settings of Africa, aimed at optimizing care and imaging intervention. He is the lead radiologist of the Stroke Investigative Research and Educational Not Network, the largest stroke industry in Africa. His core expertise is in neuroimaging with low-field MRI. He holds master's degrees in epidemiology, clinical investigation, and radiation physics. His clinical interests include stroke, dementia, and computational neuroimaging analysis with image learning techniques employed to enhance clinical decisions in brain health. He has co-authored three books and has published more than 100 scientific papers. His most recent grant from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is to strengthen MRI education and research in Africa. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let's clap for him as he comes over. Louder than that. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, Africa, I am so excited to be part of this um, landmark event in Africa. And like one of the speakers have said, it is um, something that, you know, it's beyond our imagination, and that's something that we think should have been well publicized, because we are moving from here and we're not going to go back. I'm telling you that this is a landmark event, and I'm sure in the sands of time for research in Africa, this will, you know, will be well recorded and be well reported. I want to thank uh, my guests before I speak, and my brother, Jones Obongolaj, a well-renowned scientist now and an engineer in Africa. And I want to say that um, I believe that this collaboration that we have started will go a long way to make a mark and a difference and possibly even challenge other parts of the world. That Africa can teach the world something. But Africa is ready to learn, but it's also ready to teach the world. So, um, I'll briefly tell you just my journey into research and MRI. I will give you a brief, you know, talk about the wealth, the beauty and the diversity of a dark continent, and uh, no, we can go on, we can just go on, okay? And uh, this is just the layout of my talk, let's move on. Okay, now, um, my journey, generally, I won't tell you, I'm a Nigerian, um, and I was born in a very difficult place, I was born in Kano, the northern part of Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria, as most of you will know, is a beautiful place, but it's also a very hard place. And that's why you see most Nigerians are very, very resilient, they're very tough, you know, and they always aim for what? 
to be the best because they come from a very, most Nigerians come from a very difficult background. And, um, and the country is not just physically, but it's a difficult place. But we survive. Nigerians are survivors. And I survived. Okay, next. So, um, my background in education, I went to the University of the Bagram uh, in West, West Nigeria. And I went ahead also in the University of Bagram. I obtained my degree in medicine and had a master's degree also in epidemiology and also in radiation physics. And then went, there's also a hospital in, the, in also Ibadan, and I went ahead to do my fellowship in residency in radiology at the University, of, at the University College Hospital. And that's the university, and that is the largest, you know, possibly, possibly the largest teaching hospital in Nigeria, and possibly, possibly also in West Africa. Next slide. Now, during my radiology training, it was a very uncommon part. You know, we had very little equipment to use, uh, we didn't have books, even then we didn't have internet. Internet was very, very, you know, just a, you know, a recent discovery for us in Africa. So we didn't have, we had to photocopy books. We didn't, have, well, personally, I couldn't afford to buy, you know, original books. So we had to photocopy books, you know. And even the machines that we used were very, you know, the images were not so good. But we were able to read, you know, about these machines. We didn't have, I didn't train with an MRI. MRI was not existing during my training. It was at the end of my training that we had our first MRI. And this was in 2005, that we had an MRI in my hospital. And then, of course, we had a lot of patients who were very busy. So I want to tell you also that even our training, our background, we had to learn things the hard way. You know, we had to learn about machines we didn't see. So we had a, an interesting background. Let's go on. But I was fortunate, you know, through the help of my teachers, and to have some time to travel out. And I first, my, first, my first stint out of Nigeria and out of Africa was to go to the US. I spent you know, three months at the Massachusetts General Hospital, MGH, in, you know, in Boston. And that was the first time I started seeing you know, you know, big machines, sophisticated machines working. And I, you know, I was you know, seeing how people were moving patients, how they were reporting, how they were so precise. Excellence was the watchword. You know, they didn't take, you know, you will see somebody reviewing a patient for 45 minutes, you know, trying to get and not make any mistakes. And that was the first time I got interested in research. I got interested, you know, in doing, you know, in working hard and reach, actually raising the bar for researchers and teachers in Africa. So when I went back, I went into research and I wanted to see how we could do things better in Africa. And that was what gave me the opportunity to start to innovate, to see how to encourage other people to begin to do research. I also had another opportunity to do a master's. I went to do a master's in clinical investigation at the Northwestern, uh, Houston, the Northwestern University in Chicago. And that also encouraged me to move into greater areas of research. Next. So, next slide. Okay. Um, to tell you about a dark continent, Africa is a dark continent is referred to many as a dark continent for several reasons. Some consider Africa as a dark continent because, you know, they said, okay, well, the terrain is difficult. You know, you can't get, someone else says, oh, ah, Africa is dark because people are black, you know. But some also have also posited that Africa is dark because we lack electricity. And you can see, this is the map or an overview, a satellite view of the world in the night. And you can see most areas of the world of globe are lighted. And if you look at Africa is what is the darkest part, followed by you know South America, you know. So Africa has several challenges, and one of it is electricity. And I'm hoping that the next generation of innovators will be able to breach this challenge for us. And we were able to break that, you know, that barrier of electricity in Africa. I'm telling you, no other continent will be able to challenge us. So I'm calling on innovators here. Uh, who, are, who are working on renewable energy, talking about, this is the area that limits Africa. Even our time here in, in uh, Mbarara, we have seen that how the destruction of electricity has affected us. So I'm challenging the world, I'm challenging Africa, that let's find a way of breaking this barrier. If we break this sound barrier, well, no, no, the, the, the world will not see our back, That's like, just like we say in, Af in Nigeria. Next slide. So what is Africa? Let's look at the face of Africa. Africa is a unique place. Next. 
Africa is the second largest and the second most populous continent and houses about 1.5 billion people, having about 54 independent states. It is the world, but however, it is still the world's poorest. It's the most underdeveloped continent. However, it has what? Abundant resources in the sense that there is no other continent that is as rich as Africa. We hold about 9.6% of the world's oil. We also have about 90% of the world's platinum, 90% of the world's cobalt, 50% of the world's gold, and two-thirds of the world's manganese, manganese is in Africa, and also 35% of the world's uranium is in Africa, not to talk about 75% of coltan. Africa also is what? 60% of the arable land, land that you can farm, land that you can use, is in Africa. Africa is a rich continent. Also, the world's oldest university is in Africa, which is the, uh, the uh, University of al Karakouin, which was in, is in first Morocco. It is the oldest university founded in 1859. And also, Africa is a diverse continent. It's genetically diverse. There is no other continent that's as diverse as people. We have several genetic makeup in Africa. Africa also is what? The fastest growing continent in the world. You know? And also, it about, has about 25% of the world's you know, disease burden. With all these, Africa does not have the capacity to image. Imaging what? It has least access to diagnostic imaging. And diagnostic imaging means x-rays, means CT, means ultrasound. Africa has the least access. And the top line of imaging in the world is what? MRI. So MRI is the one that answers most of the imaging questions. And Africa does not have that. Next slide. Now, what is magnetic resonance imaging? We've been talking about in, since about you know, what magnetic resonance imaging is. But actually using electromagnets to generate or create an image and harmonizing it with computers to produce an image, look inside the body from head to toe. With an MRI, you can look at very high resolution images and be able to identify what is wrong with the patient. It's not only just giving you structural images, MRI can also give you functional images. You can also be able to see disease processes that are going on the MRI and also analyze chemical structures. And that's why MRI is so beautiful and it's a top line imaging technique in the world. And that's why Africa cannot be left behind. The gap between Africa in terms of MRI technology and the rest of the world is so, I mean, it's so, it's so, it's so, it's so immense, it's so wide that we need to bridge the gap. We need to begin to bridge the gap. And that is why this event, where we are building the first MRI, we are building a prototype of the first MRI technology is important. We must make, take, make it right at this time. This is a landmark event and we must do it right. So if we're able to get, be able to solve that imaging problem with MRI, I believe in most of the equipment we use in our industry, in the healthcare industry, we'll be able to what, solve them. We'll be able to use them even more efficiently. Now, let's move next slide. Now, Globally, what you have is that you have high quality images being produced by high end systems. Most of the systems you see the, globally, MRI has moved from what? 0.5 Tesla, which is low field, to what? 1.5, which is what is generally used most part of the high or the what you call the most, de the most developed part of the world. Most of the developed parts of the world are using what? 1.5 Tesla MRI. You know, and they have now moved into 3 Tesla MRI. And possibly in the next couple of years, we we'll move to using what? Seven Tesla MRI for clinical use. Right now, seven Tesla MRI is used for research. And some areas, are, they have what? For research for 9.4 Tesla MRI. And I want, I'm happy to tell you too that even in Europe, they are launching the what? The 11.7 seven, Tesla MRI for research now in Nottingham. So these are things that the world is moving. But Africa has not been moving in terms of this technology. But I'm happy that today, with building this system in Umbara, we are making Uganda what's going to be what? The seat of development of MRI in Africa. And I'm so excited. I think the Ugandans here should be excited. Let's give Uganda a clap. <laughs> and this has been made possible by the efforts of Jones and Bongoloch. I am, I am happy that you know, his, his resilience will make a change in Africa. And we're going to work together to bring this change about. Next slide. Now, also talking about Africa. It's not just building the system. Africa has several challenges. If you look at, you know, the world, non-communicable disease is growing in Africa. But we don't have MRI technology to be able to, you know, to counteract these challenges. 
We don't have what? We don't have funding. Most of our educational systems are not funded, adequately funded, so that we can train ourselves to be able to innovate and do research. Because local industry or local funders do not give us money to do research. Most of the funding that we have in Africa comes from what? From the Wellcome Trust, come from NIH, come from international bodies. Africa's leaders are not funding education, and they must take you know, a look and begin to fund education. But what made the developed countries develop is because they funded education, and they are funding education. The US today spends more money on education than any other parts of the world. And that's why they are leading. You cannot lead if you do not know. Knowledge is what is power. So we want to encourage people, to Africans and African leaders, to fund education. We, have very, we don't have competent MRI experts. The few that we have leave the country because what? They do not have tools to work with. These are the challenges we have. Also, having coordinated programs that can train people in MRI technology are not anywhere in Africa. You don't find them in Africa. You don't have schools training people in what? In advanced technology. These are areas we must begin to look into and begin to what? To craft ways of bringing coordinated programs, coming together as Africans, creating hubs for training in this technology within Africa. South Africa is doing well. They have at least, they have the Cubic Center in South Africa, in Cape Town, where this is a hub for what? For research. And some of you have been there, have, have trained there. You, we need to have more of such centers within Sub-Saharan Africa. And I begin, I, I believe, now with this innovation, with this landmark we are doing today, we are going to set the standard for the rest of Africa. If you look in this graph, you see that what? Africa has what? Less than what? 70% of the world have minimal or zero access to MRI. And, and most of these countries that do not have access to MRI, 50, greater than 50% of them are in Africa. So Africa needs to what? To move. Africa needs to what? To begin to find ways to break this barrier. Next slide. How do we do this? Well, one of my friends, his name is uh, Bruce Obiagali, he made a statement once at a conference, the 2021 William Pilsberg Lecture Award, and this is what he said. He said, it is increasingly recognized that while there is a lot still to understand, there, while there is a lot still to understand, there needs to be a major shift from incessantly studying the problem to developing you know, interventions to resolve it. Africa has been studied for long. We have been telling how we're going to do this, how we're going to do that. This is the time for us to what? To begin to not just talk about the problems of Africa. It's the time for us to begin to talk about the solutions that we can begin to implement change the, to change the focus or change the standards of being in Africa. Next slide. So, the structural challenges, Africa challenges in MRI, major, the major challenges that we need to be able to break this barrier is to look at what? Infrastructural factors which are what? Expensive scanners. We cannot afford expensive scanners because Africa, most times, do not spend so much on what? On healthcare. So we have to find ways of what? Looking for how we can make low-cost scanners. Most of the scanners we have in Africa are obsolete already. You understand? We need to move to the next level. The other thing that we have, the challenges that we have in Africa is electricity, like I've said. Apart from electricity, internet connection, we can't begin to look for information where we have poor internet connections. So these are the barriers. You need to access the cloud, have large data. When you are doing imaging studies, you need to have what space you need to store your information. These are the challenges that we must begin to identify and address. And then our maintenance culture, we must find ways to train engineers to be able to address you know, machines, our machines. Once they are faulty, be able to access it, correct the problem, so that we can what, begin to use them. So all these are the paths that we need to, ch to checkmate. In terms of electricity, continue, next slide. You see that Africa has what you call energy poverty, as I've mentioned before. If you look at this, is a paper that was published, a paper, this other graph up below, shows a paper that was published to show the neuroscience output from Africa in the last 20 years. And we found out that most of the people that have better access to electricity, as you can see, in the areas of North Africa, that have better access, they are the ones that had the greatest amount of neurological science outputs in publications. And South Africa, and then some area you know, around, you know, Nigeria, where we, there was some form of publication, even though there was, they don't have uh, good electricity. So you can see that how we are seeing Nigeria, so even without electricity, they're able to push out science output. Next slide. Okay? So we must begin to find a balance. If we cannot afford high-end MRI machines, expensive machines, 
what, where do we go to? And I think low field MRI will be the answer for Africa to be able to make MRI more accessible to the greater population. And this callback system that Andrew Webb has told us so much about is we feel is maybe the answer because the technology is relatively cheap, it's portable, and it's possibly sustainable. So this is why we must find a balance. Even though we still need the high-end system, the 1.5 Tesla, but we know these machines are too expensive to be what? To be distributed all over Africa. Africa houses what? 1.5 billion people. Can they afford these high-end systems? If they cannot afford, let's make something that, is, that they can afford. Something that is sustainable within the region, that is robust enough to handle the energy challenges within the region. And I think, and I agree with the previous speakers, that the Hallback system, this array of magnets, may be able to answer and address this challenge. Next slide. So, in terms of innovation, so much as we thought about this again. So, the innovations that we need, we need portable MRI, you know, low cost, accessible, and have clinical impact. And Jones of Bungalow, next slide, is already doing that by building, you know, the system. So, epic is advancement that is going on. And the web is also doing, so Jones of Bungalow built a system that, you know, was had get some images, but now we are what? We are moving to another level with the whole back systems and the web is contributing to. And also with collaborations, I have collaborated with people from the University College London, you know, and we are not also seeing ways, we are seeing ways of also improving the low field MRI systems, the quality of images using machine learning techniques. And even though the machine, even though the images that come from low field scanners are what, are poor or not as good as the 1.5 Tesla or the 3 Tesla, are there other techniques that we can use to enhance these images to approach that of the 1.5 systems? So that even though you have your low field MRI, the images you get can approach that off those kind of systems. And that's what the kind of work we are doing with Daniel Alexander at uh, University College London. Next slide. A dream. You know, building MRI in Africa is a dream or a reality that has come true. I want to be part of that project. Thank you. Oh, this is better. So, I want to be part of that project. And for me, this is one of my goals. That's why I want to be able to see how we can what? Make what? Systems that are patient-centered, systems that are affordable for the generality of the people in Africa, and that is why building this system is important. And we have designed this, doing this, we must what? We must design by purpose. Next. We must design by purpose. We, must be, we have already motivated by passion. And we are already su 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 supported by partnerships around the world. And we must, we must work with precision. Precision in the sense that when I was part of this building, the last one week we have been part of building this system. And I realized that the Margin of error for building the system and making it work is like at 0.01 percent. The people that are building the system are teaching us. Next slide. You know, we must use power. We must maintain our willpower. Maintain our willpower to what? To be able to do this. Also, next slide. Even when we started building this system in Africa, I was part of the initiative. One of the greatest challenges we had was even the, the, the glue that was supposed to help in putting the you know madness together was not available, it was delayed due to what? Logistical problems. It came three days late. But we thank God that we've been able to make some, uh, make some you know, progress with that. That is why even those who are building the systems are not even here in the hall with us. Next slide. And you can see that they're not just building the MRI, they're not helping us to build the MRI, they're also teaching us how to do it. So we are working with them, putting everybody, putting together to learn the techniques so that the next system we find out how we need, we require less assistance from the you know international community and begin to what do it ourselves. Next slide. And we're working together. These are the team of people working, working late into the evening every day for the last six days. You know, we are hoping that by the end of the week, by the end of this week, we will have to, a system put together in place, and you will be part of it. You want to see, be part of the, the system that will what generate a signal. And once we do that. We have broken the barrier, and we are hoping that by the end of the week, we will celebrate, just like Jones did when they also got a signal at Penn State University with their own low-field system. Next slide. So we talk about precision. Like I said, precision work is important in building the system. This is, and also what we call, for those who have been part of the program, say that there's a check mechanism. Every time, you have to check like three times to ensure 
that what you are doing the right thing because every single any single misstep will make the system not to work therefore time energy and effort is put into making what making sure that the, the system is precise every step is precisely done and what volta like she also calls it make sure that does because they put in place a check mechanism to ensure that precision is the watchword throughout the process next slide so building this system in africa is a team effort and we have support smart africa which has been introduced eh, is an organization bringing africans together and we also have camera camera is also put it is a partner is a partner organization is a consortium which is what related with global experts and africans as well to what to strengthen what mri research mri innovations in africa and we have institutions that are working with us the institutions are what of course the Leiden university medical center yale university oxford and ucl okay and then we have funders the funders are basically nih and czi the czi is what the chan zuckerberg initiative which is funding this training program that we are having today you know so we are hoping that putting bringing all these people together we can make a change the team effort will give us success at the end of the day now smart africa jones has already talked about smart africa is a coalition of african scientists which also came it actually was better out of camera and we are working together to ensure that we can go further strengthen the partnership that we already have with global organizations and we also want to manage mri training programs for africa we are working together to achieve improved mri utility in africa and also to be able to retain and upskill our people who have been educated find ways of making them to stay back in africa and work in africa and train other people to what to train the trainers our goal is to be able to train other people to train others you know so that that chain will continue we don't want to break the chain and also we're trying to find ways we can transfer you know using artificial intelligence and data science to transfer these skills to african researchers next slide okay so I, like i said this funding this workshop that we are doing is organized by what you know the smart africa network but we also collaborate with the camera and it is what sponsored by the chan zuckerberg initiative and the chan zuckerberg initiative has given us some funding to be able to achieve certain goals our goals are to establish an african chapter of the ismrm ISMRM is the international or the global body of MRI in medicine and we want to be able to build a chapter in Africa to be able to make sure that we can relate continually with the global community by strengthening our, our bond together, build a web that is built you know, strongly within ourselves to be able to make continuous communication with the global community. And we are going to be developing curriculum for MRI certificate courses, we are going to develop master class for MRI technologists and the radiographers. We also want to develop an online resource for Africans and we're going to hold conferences and symposia within Africa, bringing speakers from all over the world to work with us to be able to what? Establish our place in our technology in Africa. Next slide. So one of the things that we need to do is uh, a comment that I just saw from, uh, that I saw recently from what? John Hopkins. And he said, I have I have had many talents given to me, and I feel that they, they are in trust. I shall not bury them, but give them to the lads who long for wider education. What we want to do, I think, is that the knowledge you have, you don't want to go to your grave with it. You want to what, deposit it for the next generation. I've spent my time doing research for the last 15 years, and the little I have learned, I want to be able to transmit it to the younger generation. And I feel that is the only way we can make a change. By what? Learning and relearning and transmitting the work we have learned to younger people or even to our, our, what, our contemporaries. Next slide. So we need to overcome these barriers of what? Of research, barriers of training, barriers of innovation. What are the things we need to do? We need to what? Look for collaborators. We need to build capacity by what? Applying and engaging in fellowship programs. We need to look for mentors that can help us. And what? We need to also talk to the world to allow for equity, you know, to give us balance, to give us a chance to compete with the world. Even because we are what? We are disadvantaged at some point. So the world must also look at, and we must also ask the world to give us even greater opportunities to be able to what? Compete with other people in the world. We are not, you know, our IQ in Africa is not less than any other part of the world. 
But we want to be given the chance to show that we can also work, contribute and make a difference. In terms of infrastructure, we need to ask our governments to make sure that internet is what? Is subsidized. People can have better access to internet. Internet is so expensive in Africa. Why is that? We must begin to challenge policymakers. Let's make it look, that is the library of the world. The internet is the library. If you want to be relevant in this age, you must have access to internet. Most Africans spend at least 20 to 30 percent of their salary in order to want to do research towards accessing, paying, and subscribing to the internet. Even though the internet in Africa is what is a little bit epileptic, but let us even have access to it, to the epileptic internet, and let it make it more affordable. So we need to challenge our governments to begin to make that. And then people who are innovators, we need to think for alternative source of energy. Electricity, like I said, is the bedrock of innovation, is the bedrock of change. So we need to look for alternative sources of energy like the solar, you know, biogas and things like that. And we need, the world now is making resources open source. So we need to look for these technologies that are open source so that we can also use them and look for partnerships, you know, and advocate, you know, for greater domestic funding and apply for grants, even local and international grants. If we begin to do this, we begin to increase the awareness of policymakers or people who can actually change things within Africa. Next slide. So, in concluding, I just want to say that, you know, there's a paradigm shift going on in imaging, and low-field MRI can begin to make that change in low- and middle-income countries. So, the global community should allow for what? A greater participation of Africans, and begin to look for Africans that they can mentor to begin to what? To make a change in their environment. Africans should be taught to fish. We don't want the world to be coming to dump things for us. We want to be taught how to do it. And that's what we are doing at this workshop. We want to learn how to build our own MRI, how to maintain our own MRI, how to develop protocols that can answer unique disease questions or unique disease pathologies in our environment. We don't want them to be always giving us answers. We want to also to be able to find the answers ourselves. And that is why I think that Africans should be taught to fish and not be given fish. So, we must, as Africans, begin to innovate or continue to innovate and ask the scientific community to allow a democratic environment for research, training, and education within the globe. So, there must, be equal, there must not be just be equality, there must be some level of equity. Let the world, let's talk to international bodies, let us give us a chance. We are already disadvantaged. So, when we come to work, when we come to compete, give us something to make us compete on the same level ground with the rest of the world. Thank you very much. I just want to thank, um, to acknowledge all those who have supported us and there are many, many that you can even see here. It's been a wonderful time and I want to promise you that this one week probably will be the best times of your life. If you are a researcher, if you are an innovator, if you are an educator, you will learn things from here that I believe will change your life. Thank you. I didn't answer the question. Uh, I wanted to say the questions that um, earlier uh, um, that was pointed initially about low field MRI and metals. With the magnetic strength that we are using, this we are using what we call the field that we are generating with these systems are ultra low field systems. They are ultra low. They are even less than one zero point one Tesla. So the magnetic strengths are very what very small. So it, even metals will not. It will, not, it, it, will not, it, will, it may distort if you are imaging around the metal. But if you are a little bit far from the metal, the image you have will not be, be distorted so much. If you are imaging the brain, which is the system we are developing, the system we are developing today or this week or this period are majorly to be able to answer questions that affect the brain. Because if you look at the imaging technologies that are available now, no system can look at the brain better than an MRI system. You can't use X-rays to look at the brain. You can't use, in adults, ultrasound to look at the brain sufficiently. You can't use what? It, well, of course, you can use CT, but CT is very what? The resolution is not as good for soft tissue. So the best system you can use in looking at the brain is MRI. So if we can improve the quality of MRI with low field, then we'll be able to answer most of the questions that affect you know, the neuro neurological systems in our environment. Now, concerning exposure, well, I don't know. Um, this workshop has been publicized 
well, maybe not as adequately enough, but we are hoping that as soon as we are able to get a signal, as soon as we are able to generate the first image, I'm sure even the president or presidents in Africa will be at that event. What will demonstrate the first clinical image from the system we are developing today. So there's still an opportunity for the presidents also in Africa to shine. Thank you very much. Um, I, I don't think that is enough for him. Has someone ever talked and you felt like a new chapter in your life has been commenced? Um, I, I used to fear the medical field so much because those things are really hard, biology. Oh. So that's why we went for physics. But now, on second thought, I think I would choose him to be my mentor and Dr. John and then go and build an MRI. That would be a good plan. Uh, for the students who are here, use this opportunity to talk to all these people. We have Dr. Patience, Dr. Precious, okay. A lot of people here who you can learn from. So utilize this opportunity. I'm, I'm very excited because I've gotten to learn a lot from this and I, I got a chance to go to the lab and work with Ivan, Tom, Vauta and all those people. And these things are really, you can get to understand and know what to do. Thank you very much. I, I think we should clap for him once again. He deserves much more. Um, I'll take this opportunity to invite, to um, introduce our beloved Deputy Akauti, Dr. Dennis Bosa, you'd stand up and wave at us. Thank you for coming. Thank you for honoring our invite. So um, I'll have comments for, from two people. Well, thank you so much for this opportunity. Once again, I'm Sylvie Wariga Nashavin, a biomedical engineer from McKellar University. Well, I've been listening uh, right away from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Professor Ogu, Ogu, I, I could, Jones, Dr. Jones, and then actually uh, cited one of the statements I was trying to bring up where he said uh, for a low field, for a low field MRI, uh, we are good to go where, when we have 0 0.3 Teslas and above, I think up to around 0 0.5. Then our first keynote speaker, Professor Andrew, who actually uh, stated it that their first prototype was 0 0.15 uh, Tesla. That's very interesting to hear. Then finally, from Professor Agobin Obono, uh, you know, engineers are meant to design solutions for whatever problem. I'm a biomedical engineer. I've been trained to design uh, med uh, solutions to medical problems in an engineering aspect. So it's crossed my back when he actually pointed it that we should stop talking about uh, problems and then come up with solutions for whatever problem we've been talking about. Um, I don't know whether it's too late, but rather it's too early to talk about the graphical user interfacing and then of, uh, of our MRI. Yes, we are trying to design this. We're coming up with the images. We're trying to uh, improve the resolution and what, whatever thing there is. But I've not seen anyone talking about the graphical user interface. Uh, personally, uh, being an undergraduate, undergraduate researcher and an embedded system software developer under the Makere Innovation Society, I've been, I was recently recruited under one of the Duke, Duke University, Makere University collaborative projects. That's laparoscopy. Where I happened, I fortunately happened to design during my last internship as a student, I happened to design a graphical user interface for the laparoscopy, a radio view imaging software for laparoscopy. And it was really, really fancy. It was really nice for me. It was very much, it was actually my first design uh, of a graphical user interface. I learned on the job. So I incorporated in machine learning to aid the diagnosis. This is a minimally invasive diagnostic procedure procedure and as well a surgical procedure. So I designed a GUI, then I incorporated in machine learning to do the anatomical landmarking of different organs of the abdomen because laparoscopy is basically done in the abdomen. And then you can actually do classification of different still different complications 
could, could be some complications in the, what, in the abdomen for diagnosis. So, well, as people were trying to present, I was waiting for that time for someone to come up and say, well, you have the images as you're trying to develop whatsoever MRI we're coming up with. But now, how about the graphical user interface? How, how are the clinicians, the radiographers you have around in the room, how are they now able to look at the image that you actually have, apparently? Uh, so, with that, with those few remarks, personally, I would be oh, very much, uh, I would be very much grateful if I'm called upon to give any help. Uh, it couldn't be uh, very bad if I volunteered for creation of graphical user interface software and then uh, the incorporation of machine learning to do classification and anatomical land marking. Uh, uh, well, that was, that was my first uh, uh, project as far as QI is concerned. Then, later on, for my final year project as a biomedical engineer, I still developed another GUI. So I, I believe I have some small, I could say small ex expertise when it comes to designing of graphical user interfaces, together with incorporation, as I've said, of machine learning for classification and then anatomical landmarking of different organs. Uh, for whatever, really dealing with the brain, it could also apply there. Uh, so that was my question. How far with the graphical user interfacing and then uh, the classification and diagnosis so. Thank you very much for that elaborate question. I think now I have already got two people to recruit. Uh, one of the people is uh, somebody who does marketing and publicity like uh, Buambale said. Uh, we have been doing this in our lab quietly and uh, even a number of people in this building probably don't know what we do down there. Even the build up uh, of what we had started doing now, we had not thought of even having a workshop until Dr. Obole said I heard that you are going to be building a system in your lab with folks from the Netherlands and Paraguay and the US. I said, yes. It was like, why don't we coin a workshop around that? I'm like, what are you talking about me? I'm just building a system. I had not planned to have any, any workshop around it. But that is how this workshop Came, came about. We had planned to have a training workshop with uh, Godwin, but it was not supposed to be part of this program uh, that I was running. So I learned from Buambale that uh, it is good to let people know what you are doing. And uh, Buambale will help me get a person who can do, in Uganda we call them paparazzi, Okay, can do a bit of marketing. Any small thing you do, they blow it up, they blow it up, and they do something like that. So I think uh, we can uh, use somebody with such expertise that uh, what you are doing, don't only do the science, but mind about the people who might want to use your science. Uh, when we come to the graphical user interface, it is the same thing. That system now, uh, even the one in the Netherlands, if you are given... Uh, you probably won't be able to do to get an image out of it because the user interface is a code. Okay, you have to go into the code and put inputs in there. So you are kind of writing the code as you do the imaging, uh, which is very difficult uh, for people who just want to do their own imaging of things. So. Developing a user interface is definitely one of the things we will want to invest in that uh, people who are going to be using the system do not have to look into the code to, put, to, put, to, to have input in in order to get an image. Okay? Uh, we recently uh, also, as part of our research group, we acquired one of the hyperfine systems. Uh, I think 
those who are in uh, MRI practice probably know that uh, a couple of years back or so, a certain company released uh, a small system, probably the size of that podium. You wheel it around and you can go with it into the, into the room. It's 0 0.064 millitesla. And uh, we installed this in one of our collaborating facilities in Mbale, about five hours drive from here. And uh, we are going to be using it for uh, doing research and comparing those images with the CT at the moment because in that facility they use CT for doing uh, brain imaging. So we want to compare the two. The protocol has been written but not yet approved. So uh, we have some images but they are, we could say they are still illegal. Uh, but the, the system, we, we, we like it. It works pretty well. It's a small system and, but it is still over 700 kilograms that system. It looks uh, uh, a bit uh, light, but when you try to lift it, that is when you realize that it's a monster. Uh, so, but that system has a good graphical user interface. You have an iPad and uh, you tap in, you just select this. I want to image the head, you select the head. What are the parameters you want for the head? T1 imaging, you select T1 and you spit out an image. But our system here still has a little bit of a way to go before we can get a, a, a much more user-friendly graphical interface. But we will definitely have to do it. Thank you. Um, so we shall have uh, Professor Godwin answer the other question which was sent online. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. I want to thank... Um, the last uh, speaker, just like Dr. Jones said, we, this is the purpose of this kind of thing, to be able to recruit young, motivated people. What you need is mentorship. You need somebody to hold your hand and say, look, I will help you achieve your goal. And I'm making a commitment in doing this workshop. And that's what we are going to do. If we find you, if you're highly motivated, we'll look for mentors for you to work with you to achieve your goal, to solve problems that you have within your region. Thank you very much. Now, the question from online says, can we use low-field MRI to diagnose epilepsy? Perfectly well, we can. But with every system, there's a limitation. I've been working with low-field MRI for the past 15 years. And we also have a collaboration with University College London where we are looking at pediatric epilepsy and how to, we can improve the images we get from our low field scanners to see how we can get better diagnosis. There are some conditions, some epilepsy conditions that are very subtle that you may not be able to pick up on a low field. But I can assure you that greater than 60% of things that cause epilepsy in children, you can also pick it with a low field scanner. You understand? Things that cause like traumatic cases, like structural congenital abnormalities, you know, gross anomalies, you can pick it with a low field scanner. You don't need a high-end scanner to be able to make, you know, diagnosis of all conditions, no. There are certain conditions that you will need a high-end scanner, but about, maybe about 10 to 20% of conditions within where we have in Africa, you need a high-end scanner. But most of the conditions we have in Africa that we are dealing with in Africa, 80% of them, I dare say, you can make do very well with a low-field scanner that is what optimized in terms of contrast and resolution. You can make do with it. For traumatic cases, they are very straightforward. You can make for tumors, large tumors. Low field scanners will answer most of the questions. But when you're looking for subtle changes, subtle microscopic changes that usually microstructural abnormalities, therefore you will need what? High end scanners. So high end scanners have their place. But low field scanners are what? Will be more relevant for us in low and middle. We'll be able to address more problems and solve more problems with low field scanners. But Lala, don't be, uh, what do you call it, confused about it. You still need what? The high-end scanners. And our goal is to be able to make, make MRI more accessible so that more people can have what? Can make their, get earlier, quicker diagnosis. CT is good for traumatic cases. You know, even for stroke. Stroke with CT, except the patient has had stroke for a substantial length of time. Maybe like two hours or so, or three hours before CT may be able to show you some changes. But with MRI, 
within 30, 45 minutes of a stroke, you can be able to what? Make diagnosis. So what we are trying to say is that we want to be able to make diagnosis of stroke at the spot, within the clinic. You don't have to travel five, six kilometers or five, six miles or, or 10, what I mean, 10 hours before you can get a stroke, uh, sorry, a CT or an MRI or an imaging. We want to be able to create systems that within clinics around Africa and around the world, if you have a stroke quickly, you can get imaging and then get what? Properly diagnosed and then properly treated. So these are the kind of things we are saying. These systems are what? Are available, can be made better. I want to start by at least from a, from a point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being attentive. We've come to an end of today's activities. So uh, there is someone who wants to say something. We are out of time, so you have to be brief. You can also come as I walk to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Godwin. Uh, my question is, uh, this being the first of this kind in Africa, I beg, I think we have a lot, there is a lot to be done. Uh, you talked about a mentorship. Then I wanted to know uh, whether in, in, in your program, how, how the young graduates, the ones that have uh, the ones that are recently graduated and the ones that are still in school, how are they going to benefit from this project and how will the mentorship be done? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Um, we have limited funding. And I want to say this is the opportunity again to thank the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, they've given us some money to train people. But what we are starting with is the first step. We can train everybody. So we are selecting people. Even for this call, we had so many applications, but we could not invite everybody. So what we are doing, what we are doing in terms of we are selecting those who already have exposure who are already doing some level of research. We'll upskill them, we'll upskill them, move them up, and encourage them to train people under them. So it's like we're going to look for people who are motivated so that they can also go back and train other people. So for those who are just graduating and all that, still maintain your interest. We will get to you eventually if we get more funding. And the whole idea is to be able to look for more money and to encourage more people to fund educative programs. So the goal of this workshop is majorly targeted for now at people who are already doing some MRI practice, who have some ideas and all that. But if you're a young person and you're well motivated, please tag along with those who are already being sponsored. Because you, you, that means you're going to be mentored by somebody who is being mentored. Everything in life is what? Is in stages. So don't, if you're just graduating, keep your, your stamina. Keep your, you know, your energy up. It will come to you eventually. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Godwin. So for the students, if you're really interested, just befriend these people. That's the best thing you should do. Don't now go back and forget about the question you just asked. Come, befriend him, and you learn something from him. So we've come to an end of our uh, workshop for now. Oh, we've come to an end of the opening ceremony. So after this, we're going to have a group photo outside, right in front of the faculty building. And then we shall go to first floor. Uh, when you use the stairs, you then turn <laughs> on, your, on your left, the first room on your left. Lillian will help us, guide us all to the room where we shall have lunch. Then after that, we shall go to the lab, which is in the other building. 
you all be guided by uh, was, we shall be guided by Simwe and Ivan and all the people who know where the lab is. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you. I hope you learned a lot from this and clap for yourselves for being attentive. Um, group photo, we're going to stand right in front of the faculty building. We, we don't have much time, so we have to move faster than that. Please carry what we've given you. You can also carry the water, your books, and everything because you're not coming back here. We're going straight for the group photo and then lunch and the lab blast. MRI is one of the most important diagnostic imaging techniques in the hospital, but it's incredibly expensive. And so for much of the world, it's simply not available. So could we design a very cheap, very sustainable, and very accessible MRI system for the developing world? That's the topic of this talk. My name is Andrew Webb. I'm a professor of MRI physics in the Department of Radiology here at the Leiden University Medical Center. And the title of the talk is A Portable and Affordable MRI System, Science Fiction. So let's imagine we go back in time uh, to that of Boer Harbor here in Leiden. And if you're a clinician, you have no way of seeing inside a body of a patient. What's going on? The only option then is surgery to cut into the patient. And this has been the way for thousands of years. And then everything changes. In 1896, almost exactly 125 years ago, this person, Willem Konrad Röntgen, working in Unterfranken, the University of Würzburg, discovers something he's not quite sure what they are, but he calls them x-rays. And he takes an image, and since he's not sure if these things are dangerous or not, of course the first person he images is his wife, and he gives us this, the first non-invasive image of the human body, looking inside the human body. And then during the 1900s, many new imaging technologies evolve, uh, and these ones, if you look at the early parts of these, these are all very clunky pieces of equipment, and they're giving us relatively coarse images, but even so, this allows us to look inside the human body and it changes how we do medicine. And in my own area of MRI, the first scanner in the Netherlands here, uh, 40 years ago, delivered to the LUMC, also looking uh, quite clunky and giving images here which look you know, very coarse resolution and grainy, but you can still start to see inside the brain of the patients. And if we look today at the scanners at the LUMC, we see very expensive, very sophisticated scanners giving us really beautiful, beautiful images uh, inside the brain. But, a favorite Dutch word, ma, we have to think about what has not changed. And what has not changed in MRI is the fact that it's incredibly expensive and it's very, very inaccessible to much of the world because of that. And if we look at why, it's not just the cost. So the cost is a lot, one or two million euros. But we have to think we have to make the system work inside a shielded room. We have to have high power, cooling water, very expensive. We have to have a contract to fix this thing every year. That's very expensive. And we have very, very trained technicians who also add to the cost. So why even in the Netherlands do we need to think about more affordable health care? Well, if we look at projections here, within the EU, we have almost 3% growth as a function of GDP, but the Netherlands is projected to be almost 6. So we start to get spiraling health care costs. And let's think a little bit further outside the Netherlands. If we look at the world as a whole, more than 70% of the world has no access to MRI whatsoever. And this was the starting point of us thinking about trying to develop more cheap and accessible systems. We've been working with a group in sub-Saharan Africa in Uganda on the subject of pediatric hydrocephalus. So this is Waterhoft, water on the brain in kids. And you can see it's an easy thing to image. You've got an MRI because you're just looking at the fluid inside. Is there blood there? Have you put in a shunt? Has the fluid gone? Has the fluid not gone? 
But of course, there is no MRI in Uganda. So could we build a low-cost system, 20 or, or 30,000 euros, which is sustainable and portable, it could be used in Uganda. So could we make it 1% of the cost, and in addition, not to be housed in a hospital like the LUMC here, but rather to be portable so it could be taken from village to village. And if we look at the challenges, we have to say, what do we need currently? Well, we've got to cut the cost, right, by 99%. So this is not a simple cost cut. We have to make sure that there are no maintenance costs. So if something breaks, it has to be repairable. We can't have something where the temperature is nicely controlled and we have power that runs all the time. So this thing has to be very robust. And finally, we've got to make it very, very simple to run. And we have to look at how do you design things sustainably. Here in the Netherlands, it's probably the most sustainable cell phone. Uh, and if we look at why is it sustainable, it's easy to repair, it's always upgradable, and ultimately you can recycle those components. And so those are the things that we're going to try and build into our design. So we design our magnet from very, very simple, very cheap magnets here. These are similar to the ones that are holding things up on your fridge, a little bit stronger than that. But we use thousands and thousands of these. And we put them in certain configurations, which again, mathematically is quite complicated, which I won't bore you with. But we get this so that we get a perfectly uniform magnetic field. And we use these very small magnets so that they're safe. There's no danger in them uh, coming together with uh, strong forces. And that means that's important for local production. So here's the magnet that we produce. So not a million euros, but 10,000 euros, and not one ton, but 70 kilos, something that could be carried by a couple of people or maybe even put in a back feet. 25 centimeter diameter means that we can scan children's heads. Lots of other equipment goes into an MRI system, of course, and all of these components we've designed so that they can be put on the 3D printer. And a key part of this in terms of sustainability is that everything is open source. So all the parts, all of the designs are available for people so they can do it themselves or they can repair things easily. And this is to keep in with the general US sustainable development goals. So here's the whole setup that we put together. You can see it fits on a table, it's not inside a particular room, and it just plugs into the wall. And what kind of images do we get out? Well, they're certainly not as good as the 2 million euro based system. But if you look at these, you can see that to look at hydrocephalus, to look at fluid, these are certainly good enough. And we can even separate out the white matter and the gray matter in the brain. And this is a key part of a project we're running with the Gates Foundation in terms of looking at pediatric brain development in developing countries uh, and how that is affected by things like malnutrition and countermeasures to that. And we can also image within the forearm or the leg, we can look at the muscle and the lipid, the fat around that. And of course, this is a very non-invasive way of looking at nutritional deficits, malnutrition, and again, how the programs that are being set up to try and counteract that are actually working. One of the additional factors that is nice about these very low field MRI systems is that normally if you've got a metallic implant or you have a shrapnel wound through a war zone, you can't have an MRI. But we can do that. So if you look at your 1.5 or 3 Tesla, which are the standard MRI systems, the image is destroyed by any of these metallic implants. This 50 milli Tesla system, much weaker at the top there, you see there's no such artifacts. So if we look at the advantages of our low field, very cheap, no sighting cost, 